Okay, I think we're good to go. Uh, hello again, I'm Harish. I lead platforms and community at AngelAct. And this is Learn with AngelAct, a series of workshops where we bring in experts to talk about various uh, topics in tech, design, and everything related to both of those. And today is API best practices for backend developers. And our speaker for today is Minaj. Minaj has 15 years of experience working on scalable architectures, distributed computing, big data analytics, and microservices, and much more. And he has worked with all range of companies from startups to global enterprises. And he excels at team leadership, software development, microservices, and also AWS. I think he's the right person to speak about. What are some best practices that you should think about when you're writing RESTful APIs? At any point in the session, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A or the chat box. And if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, we'll pick the questions from the chat. Minaj, thank you so much for uh, doing the session today. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Arish. Thanks for the introduction. I'll share my screen and then start the talk. Okay, so um, hello, everyone. Uh, again, um, so I think we have now eight participants it will be great to know that how many of them are developers or back-end developers anybody here is a back-end developer okay. i guess none <laughs> never mind yes uh, i think yeah a couple of them are we have yeah 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 they are there are backend developers. Okay. And one, yeah. <laughs> Ali's backend developer. I'm working a full stack developer. Ashik Ahmad is backend developer. Okay, great. Great. Cool. Miguel is a full stack developer. Okay. That's uh, okay. That's great to know about you guys. Okay, so guys, uh, today's session is about API best practices, and uh, basically, uh, I've created these slides and breaking down into ten tips to design the uh, API APIs and what should be those ten best practices. I um, I will actually take you through those ten best best practices to follow while making REST APIs. This will make you the best. API is possible and also make the lives of your API consumer easier, like your front end developer, your mobile developer. And these are the practices that I've been following throughout my career of uh, 15 years development. Um, so before that, I think uh, um, Harish has given a, a great introduction about me. Uh, again, uh, I'm a solution architect by profession, passionate about building scalable backend services making deployment funds and i have worked with few startups in dubai uh, like kobon.com selenica yalla compare and at the moment i'm building at bankonas.com i'm i'm also an angel hack winner in dubai and uh, a judge and now i'm working as an angel hack uh, ambassador uh, for dubai okay great okay so now before before we start the session why do we need first the APIs? Like, okay, 10 best practices I'll share in my session, but why do we need the APIs? Anybody, anybody could guess why do we, why, why those APIs are required? Why do we need the APIs? Well, to start with, I think in the web, exactly easiest way to talk, uh, Harish said easiest ways to talk to other application regardless of UI and to provide database with our info. Ashik said uh, to communicate between client and server. Miguel said to provide access to our services. Exactly, all of those answers are correct. In a, so in a, if I want to explain the, what are the APIs to a, a, like a non-tech person, so how I explain it is, a, so for example, the language we communicate is called English or any other language that we speak. I call the API is the language of the systems. This, the API is the language of the system that 
helps to system to talk with each other. That's the easiest way to explain it to somebody why, what are the APIs and why the APIs. I think in the web development specifically, REST APIs play an important role in ensuring smooth communication between the client and the server. You can think of client as a front end and the server as the back end. Now communication between the client front end and the server isn't usually super direct. So we use an interface called an application programming interface to act as an intermediary between the client and the server. Because API plays a crucial role in the client server communication. We should always design APIs with the best practices in the mind. This helps the developers maintain them and those consume them as well, not run into issue while performing those duties. So today's session is all about those best practices so that uh, uh, so the, the APIs that you make helps you to develop better systems, improve your overall software architect. Okay, so the very first one, uh, usually when, when you're designing REST API, you should not use the verbs in the endpoint path. And the endpoint should use nouns signifying what each of them does. This is because the, the basic reason is because HTTP methods such as get, post, put, patch, and delete are already in the verb form for performing the basic CRUD, like create, read, update, delete. So here I have uh, mentioned a few examples. For example, if you, have, if you have an API, which returns an array of a banks, it should be like instead of get banks, uh, I will show you in the next slide, what are the some example of the verbs or the bad example of the endpoints? So in this slide, as you can say, if you need a banks list, your API should, uh, your endpoint should be called API slash banks and it returns the list of the banks. And if you pass the ID, it returns a single object of that ban. Um, and again, if you notice the difference uh, between the first and the third one, the endpoint are similar, just the HTTP method gets changed post and get uh, in the post, uh, if you change the, if you use the get method, it should, this is also one of the, uh, I covered that in one of the slide that why we should use the get and post. Uh, so post should actually help you to create the, alter the database state and get always should retrieve, used for retrieving the information. Now in the next slide, there are some of the, there are some of the example of the verbs which should not be followed for creating the endpoints because this can create uh, the whole new bunch of problems. For example, get all banks. If you need like get all new banks, get all old banks, get all bank by name, there can be, these names can be very confusing, create new bank, uh, delete new banks. So these are the, some of the examples we should not follow while creating the endpoints. Yes, uh, Muhammad Imran said Leon's example. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure these are like, uh, these are the common best practices and everybody uh, who have a scalable and uh, sensible software team follow these examples. Now, now that brings me to question, for example, what about the actions that don't fit into the world, world of CRUD operations, right? For example, I have an example here. Uh, in GitHub provide you an API to star adjust, okay? Now for that, uh, GitHub, what GitHub does it, they provide and put API slash gist, uh, gist and slash ID of the uh, gist and then slash star. And the same they follow for if you want to unstar uh, a gist. So these, in this way you can follow uh, the APIs which doesn't fit into the CRUD criteria exactly. Okay, now the second second best practice that I follow is make a rule that HTTP request should not alter the state or change anything in the database. It's purely for fetching the information. This will be like your the, a rule in overall architect, okay? So developers are also communicated in a way that if any endpoint expect, uh, uh, accept a get request, it won't uh, alter the database. It won't change anything in the database. It's always, to retrieve the information from the database. So that's that's the best, best way to use your HTTP methods uh, 
uh, get for getting the information, post for posting the information, put for updating the information, and delete for. Uh, some people use the put for uh, put for put for updating and deletion both, and some people choose to use the delete for deletion and put for uh, updations. Third, my third tip is oftentimes different endpoints can be interlinked. So you should nest them so it's easier to understand. Understand, For example, in this uh, uh, slide, you can see um, the first endpoint, which says get car 7-Eleven drivers, return a list of drivers for the car 7-Eleven. So if you have, have the database, a relational database, cars, there are many cars, and then cars can have many drivers. Each car can have many drivers. So this is the way that how it can be, you can use the sub resources for relations. Um, and if you, for example, if you need this specific driver, uh, this is the endpoint that, uh, that returns the driver number four for the car 7-Eleven. So that's how you can use the sub resources for relationships. Now that's also a very interesting one. Usually this is a, a, a personal choice, but you can think of uh, like, if, if you use the plural uh, nouns in your endpoint, then by default, if your endpoint is called like www.com slash API slash banks. So it, it say it's in the name that it will return the list of the banks. So you can think of data of your API as collection of different resources from your consumer. So if you have an like like an endpoint uh, slash banks, it will return the list of the banks instead of the uh, single bank. And then if you need a single bank, then you pass a parameter of that bank in, uh, after that. So it's a good choice to use the plural no nouns instead of the singular noun. The fifth one is supporting the multiple formats. I think this is not, uh, I mean, this is good to have feature. This is not the, uh, not the exactly that, uh, not all the APIs provide, but if you are like, if your client are expecting uh, XML instead of JSON, then it's good to provide the multiple formats and the multiple formats can be, for example, I have given an example of Google uh, takes in parameter to, uh, to understand on the server level that what is the response that client is requesting for either JSON or something else, Foursquare. Um, Foursquare, if, is, if you just add a dot JSON extension at the end of the endpoint, it will return you the uh, JSON format. Dig accepts a header application JSON, uh, and then the, in that header, if you specify JSON or XML, it returns that type of response in the API response. This is uh, this is interesting one. Use the Hetios links. So, so what is Hetios basically? As everybody uh, is anyone aware of uh, Hetios uh, links or Hetios? Uh, um, what do I say? REST application architect. Okay, no way. So Hetios, so its literal meaning is hypermedia as an engine of application state is a constraint of the REST application architect. Hetios keeps the REST style architect unique from most other network application architect. So basically, yeah, basically, uh, so basically, what it does is whenever you your your client calls an API, it returns uh, such uh, meta information in the response to tell that. For example, uh, for example, in my in my if you see if you look at my current slide, if your app API provide the pagination, it gives you the pagination links uh, in the paging uh, object, previous and the next, so that it's easier for the client to just use those links instead of like building those links at the client side. So that's also very important. Like you can then. Uh, the, you can remove the guesswork from the client side to create those links, the pagination links and calculate what are the number of the data on the, uh, like in the data set and then create the links. So that's also a good, good idea to provide such information in your response.
um, like ES do in case of aggregation. I'm not sure what is what what is ES mean. Ali Ali mentioned, um, but uh, could be could be the same thing that what I'm saying. Cool. Okay. Right. Seven. So always try to provide the filtering, sorting, field selection, and paging for collection. So if your API, for example, um, for example, returns a collection of cars, uh, you should it should accept parameters for, for example, returning how many re re records front end require for the uh, in the one result. Uh, what field there should be for the sorting if you need the sorting on a manufacturer or model or or color these these parameters are good to have uh, uh, in your part of your endpoints uh, now field selection this one is also a, a, a important and it could be uh, it could be very, it could be very important depending upon your uh, use case so for example um you have a web, you have a page on a mobile where you show a list of products now on the list of products you don't need the uh, information about uh, for example uh, all the detail of the product uh, on the list of the uh, li list page you just need the image of the product you need the name of the product maybe the pricing that's it right you don't need the variation and stuff like that so you you can design your endpoint that whenever i need the list of the product I need only this information so that your API and the response and re request remains uh, 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 like a lightweight, so that uh, you you need you you call for the information which are, which is required for the uh, display to the uh, at the end. This will help to keep your uh, communication lighter and faster with the server. Um, you, you you call for the information which are, which is required for the uh, display to the uh, at that. Uh, so I just I think I just clicked on the link that he said of the YouTube. Anyways, <laughs> it's the live stream. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So the next one is uh, this is a this is also very important versioning your API. So why the versioning is important? These are the some of the examples like different companies provide the versioning their endpoints. So uh, to will you, to will you actually add the date uh, date in their endpoints? Salesforce uh, use this way of version twenty point zero in their endpoints. Twitter again also add the version number in their endpoints. Facebook take as a parameter, not part of the endpoint. Oracle is also takes the parameter, uh, uh, not the parameter. It's part of their endpoint. Now, why versioning is important? Uh, versioning is also one of the very critical uh, part of uh, your APIs and endpoints, uh, especially when you are developing the APIs for mobile apps. Because for mobile apps, once the, your mobile app is installed at the client end, it's difficult to get that software updated uh, because it's it's in the customer's hand then whenever they want to update. And if you have added a new feature in your API and that doesn't support, uh, I mean, that your client, your, API, your mobile app doesn't support that new feature in the API, that will make the build break. That will go the app crash maybe. So it's that, that's why it's important that you build, you provide the versioning of your APIs and then you use those versions in the uh, in your clients uh, as required. Okay, now handle now, now my ninth uh, ninth tip is use the HTTP status codes and try to map them clearly to relevant standard base. Codes. So I usually provide uh, my APIs, my endpoints usually does these three, uh, provide these three signals at then either everything works or something client, uh, something goes wrong at the client. Uh, and for example, if client is calling an API and then they're missed to, uh, they're missed uh, some parameters which it's API is expecting or the API did something wrong or there's something wrong on the server level. So the, 
the api's uh, endpoint response boils down to these three situation either they have success client error or server error so i usually uh, um, start i usually follow these three codes if everything goes fine apis are okay i use the http return status 200 if there's a bad request 400 and if there's an internal server error, for example your server is down or database connectivity issue then it's 500 error and if you're not comfortable reducing all your errors in condition to these three, try picking among these additional five. For example, if your endpoint creates something, a new user or a new uh, registration, uh, return the HTTP status code 201, which is a standard way of, uh, which is a standard code for uh, uh, mentioning to the client that, okay, there's something created. 304, not modified, 404, a famous one, not found or unauthorized um, when somebody is trying to access the endpoints which is uh, which required authentication returns return the 401 and 403 forbidden if uh, again something goes wrong on the server level okay so the last one the rate limiting uh, Provide the rate limiting in the in the APIs uh, in your end uh, in your API projects. Now this is this becomes very critical if you have, for example, expensive operations on the server side in your APIs. Then what could be the expensive operation, guys? Any guess what could be the expensive uh, operation? I think the backend developer should be able to guess easily what could be the expensive operation on the server side. Okay, so exactly writing large amount of data, memory hungry. Exactly, memory hungry involves like multiple systems to be called in behind the scene and then custom client is waiting. Exactly, one of the example of the expensive operation is sending the emails, right? Because it's not in your control how the mail server is working, what, how is the mail server is configured, what type of configuration is there. We use the mostly like sending the emails or sending the SMS, these type of services, we use third party services, right? And those third party services are not in our control. So I call them expensive uh, operations because um, uh, for if, if any operation uh, called, uh, by a, a client calls those operation that uh, uh, then the server actually process everything and then returns the response until then client is waiting for that. Now, the rate limiting becomes very important. For example, if you have a functionality of forgot password in your API, in your endpoint, and somebody just uh, just try to put that, uh, somebody just get access to that endpoint and just put a simple loop to create, uh, to send that, that request again and again. Imagine like simple loop of 100,000, a million or a billion can shoot out million billions of the email and that can be really expensive in terms of like processing and computing for you. So rate limiting is very becomes very important in such scenarios where you uh, actually look at the clients, for example, um, if, the, if the same client has sent the same request in more than 10 times in, a, in one second or more than two times in a second, and then you deny those requests. So that will keep your server, uh, server uh, not busy and you know, avoid uh, avoid the uh, expensive operations. Cool. So these uh, these were the uh, ten tips that I wanted to share with uh, everyone here. I'm open for any questions, any discussion. If you guys have, um, yeah. And uh, I have a joke actually about the APIs. What was the API's favorite song? Any guess, guys? Okay. Then let's jump to the questions after that. I have no idea. <laughs> Call me maybe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I, yeah. Okay, so guys, uh, any questions? Also, I want to uh, I want you to go 
go to my GitHub as well and check out. I have few open source APIs, um, APIs and projects there. Check out those and give it give give a star if you like them or follow me because I keep posting the experiments that I do on the side on the GitHub. I'll post the link here. Done, done. Great. Thanks, Manaj. I think it was really crisp and also just to the point. And uh, yeah, I hope participants have uh, a lot of questions. I have a bunch of questions. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with the first question from Ashik. He says, should we set the rate limiting on the server side or in API request itself? Um, it, uh, I think, no, I think it's a good, uh, it should be, usually I do it on the server side, uh, but uh, what I do is I also uh, uh, add this information in the response in, in the header, like what is the rate limit on the server side and what are the remaining, what is the remaining limit? So for example, if there is a login API and you, there's a li limit for the login attempt, and then I return that that okay now three attempts are left if you uh, if uh, if you call them again and again that will be you will not get the proper response so it's it's best to uh, actually I usually set it on the server side. Great for everybody watching if you have any questions please post them in the chat or the Q&A box. Another question that we have on YouTube is uh, can you talk a little bit about the difference between put and post? Put and post. So I mean, so both are the HTTP methods. Uh, put uh, mostly, uh, uh, I've seen in the as a best practice. Mostly people use when you have any update in the existing uh, data, and post is being used when you want to create some new data. So that's how you can distinguish your endpoints. Put uh, you always used for the for for updating the data and post for posting the new data. Now Ashik also asked another question, how to do API documentation. So now that, that uh, depends uh, what kind of like framework uh, you are using for developing your APIs. I've seen like uh, there are, usually there are like uh, plugins that you, uh, that you can use to generate. If you are uh, writing the code in a certain way that will generate the documentation for you. But that doesn't work all the time because uh, uh, not all the APIs are straightforward CRUD operations. Uh, the other ways is I usually uh, I usually do uh, take a like a like a uh, online HTML template. Uh, I think most most of the API documentation follow that, and uh, that HTML template also supports Markdown to create your documentation. In the documentation, I mentioned how what should what is the endpoints, what are the parameters it accepts, what type of response it returns. Um, can we Ahmed asked, can we use social media APIs? Yeah, obviously, of course we can. We should. I mean, depending upon what what is your uh, what is your use case, like uh, um, like Facebook login API is one of the commonly used uh, uh, API that. If you want to provide an a, uh, a way for your user to sign up using the Facebook instead of registering and putting all their information, they use Facebook uh, API for that. Atul has asked the latest technology to be concentrated and learn to upskill our API developer for beginners. For beginners, for the latest te uh, technology, I would... Um, I would suggest like a Node.js, there's a lot of, uh, the, I mean, there's there's a lot of talk about the Node.js and then um, in the Node.js, uh, you have these frameworks called like, um, um, like libraries called Express, which helps you to build the APIs quickly. That could be, that would be a good, uh, good start if you are a beginner. And uh, otherwise, like if you have a, a background of like you have learned some of the Java or some of the Python, those are also good frameworks to start learning. Uh, for start learning for the API development. How to do API monitoring? Now that's uh, that's an interesting one. How do we do the API monitoring? So so now there are like. Uh, so when you deploy your application on AWS, the AWS have this uh, feature called WAF, Web Application Firewalls. The firewalls actually give you some uh, a lot of information like what 
how many times uh, the APIs is uh, is called, and uh, like if there was there were any uh, response, uh, any API requests were rejects and stuff like that. Apart from that, like uh, essentially your APIs are deployed on your server, right? So you deploy some monitoring tools on your server, Negios or maybe like New Relic that constantly monitor your server. Uh, what kind of processes are running, if there are any uh, processes which are taking time more than other processes, stuff like that. I hope that answer your question, Ashik. If uh, not, please uh, feel free to ask more. On similar lines, Minaj, I think I have a question, which is, uh, what are some tools to load test APIs when you're talking about rate limiting and all? How does a developer load test? Um, Usually, uh, I mean, to load test, um, like there are, I, I don't remember exactly, like once we have uh, used a third party tool, uh, it was a, like a third party tool that we have used, we have integrated uh, to test the penetration and load testing, like what are, uh, how much maximum, I can't recall that, uh, like, yeah, JMeter for load stress test, could be is a good idea as well to test your uh, yeah like server code if you are if your application is the java based application okay I'll, I'll probably take the liberty to ask more of my questions yeah yeah sure okay yeah i think you should you can take ashik's question first yeah he's asking so, apart from post put get and delete which others are important I think the most important is the post and the get uh, because like uh, these fits post and the get are fits usually most of the uh, cater most of your requirements. I so the options is hardly people use and uh, even the delete and so for example delete is also something that uh, uh, alter the database so uh, people I've seen like I've personally also used like post for deleting. Uh, the resources and uh, instead of put also using the post as uh, updating the database. I think these are the important, uh, in my opinion, these are the most important uh, HTTP methods. Uh, the other one is the options, which is, I, I really use that. Okay, we have exactly. another question. Yeah. Is post the new man. I, I'm not sure about the new man, but Postman is definitely the number one tool for testing your APIs. And uh, it's very handy, very easy to use. And uh, um, you can set up uh, your endpoints in a way like uh, you can configure your server if you if your APIs are on the testing environment, production environment, with a few clicks, you can change your uh, base URL. Postman is the, I think, in my opinion, is the number one uh, best tool for testing your APIs. why is option used for um so to be honest uh, ashika i have never used options i i don't uh, i don't remember exactly why the people use the options uh, http method okay i'll i'll quickly sneak in one question that i have i think my question is about authentication right uh, there are a bunch of ways API developers use authentication. For example, Facebook uses OAuth, uh, mm -hmm. and then there is Airtable and tools like that, the new age so-called no-code tools, which use API key-based authentication, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sometimes it is, to be honest, API key is faster to integrate with the system compared to OAuth, get like a token, and then it expires. What do you think is the best way to go about deciding what authentication to build on an API? So, uh, so essentially, uh, um, Harish, you, you have mentioned like OAuth and Facebook. Uh, so these are the different ways of authentication. Facebook, uh, Facebook is not itself an authentication uh, mechanism. Underlying, they use the OAuth uh, uh, principles to authenticate the users. So um, personally, like OAuth, I think OAuth is the best. Uh, personally, I've used OAuth in most of my applications to authenticate. And uh, on top of that, you can provide add this functionality like provide the 
uh, authentication using the Facebook or Gmail or any other which any other tool which is commonly used where people have mostly accounts and they can use easily to authenticate that. And honestly, the best way is actually to register the user and then return the token and then keep using that because REST APIs are the stateless uh, stateless APIs. Once your request goes to the server and server returns the response, it forgets about you. Now, in order to remember the server, you will always send the uh, token so that server knows that, okay, this request is coming from Harish, this request is coming from Anaj. So, Joshua is asking on YouTube, uh, he's asking, can you talk a bit about securing APIs? For example, cores or any other ways? Yes, cores, yeah. I mean, uh, cores is, uh, so I think cores is the, is the topic for the front end, uh, but uh, the other ways like, yeah, like uh, securing your APIs, you implement these auth uh, strategy or, uh, you know, uh, the tokens and, um, and the JWT return the JWT token uh, that uh, that that so JWT is also follow a standard uh, uh, standard uh, to generate the token so that I think so in my in my experience whenever I have added a functionality to secure the API it works in a way like uh, the user ask for a token and then token is being returned to the customer and then also in the response it also mentioned that this token is going to expire in this many minutes or hours or days um shrik srinaket has asked how to integrate two different apis like use a format api and upload the data to any like a table motion api now that's a very like that's a very broad question how to integrate two different apis like use a format forms api and upload the data to any like table so like for example okay so i think the better question would be if you have an a endpoint and your client call that endpoint and behind the scene you're calling two systems let's say a table api or notion api right um it depends what is exactly your use cases uh, for example um for example if you take an example of if you have an api for forget password um what i usually do is in that case uh, so you user call the forget password api and that behind the scene it sends a email to the uh, to the customer to uh, for retrieve the password or link to set the password so now in that case, what I do is uh, I usually call a third party uh, uh, API asynchronously instead of waiting for the response for that to complete. I just send a response that the process is completed. And then behind the scene, the API is being called for sending the email and then make sure that email is uh, called. And if it fails, then some sort of trigger some sort of alert to the developer that that, the fun that functionality is failed so then they can take uh, manual action on that the ashik has asked the best way to store the auth token like inside local storage sessions cookies or any other so i mean i think this is a question uh, in terms of uh, like in on the client side what is the best way to store a token right I think if you're a, if you're if you have a um, web application, local storage is a really good example, uh, a way to store your token. Uh, cookies, uh, I mean, I, if I'm not sure the local storage. So local storage is a fairly a new uh, new mechanism in the browser. Old browser used to not have the local storage. So, but cookies were there like since the start of the browser. So cookies are are the most commonly used way to store the uh, tokens in the client side. And uh, then it's mostly then it, I think it, it come down to your personal preference. How do you want to, what do you want to use in modern application these days? Like if I had to develop a front end application, I usually use the local storage. Cool. Um, any other Minaj, questions? Yeah, yeah. I, I I have a couple more. Yeah, yeah, sure. What frameworks do you use to build APIs usually? 
what is what is your choice the go, go, can, can you repeat sorry i didn't get that uh, what frameworks do you use for building apis ah okay understood cool so uh, in as i mentioned in the start i'm a like a more i call myself a back end developer i am a java developer uh, by heart and uh, i use uh, frameworks like spring boot and grails framework i have also uh, like in a recent project uh, which was uh, required to implement the node js i have also built the apis using the express js uh, on the on the node js but mostly uh, in my experience i have built the apis using the java got it yeah the next one i have is about uh, pagination right um, mm -hmm. when when is the right time to include pagination is it just about the amount of data that is going to appear in the browser or in the request response right or is it about uh, giving a much more structured response like what is the ideal scenario to decide saying okay mm -hmm. for this call i will include pagination yes so see the pagination is about two things um, primarily one is the real estate available on the screen right like for example uh, if you have millions of the record it's not going to even help if you don't if you just render all those million of the records at once on the screen right uh, so you smartly use the real estate of the screen how much space is on the screen so that uh, uh the only the limited information is visible and then the more information is required so that's the one thing the smart way of using the real estate the second is about uh keeping your response and request faster right if you have like for example even google if you search on the google if google starts showing all the billion records on the first page it will be really heavy operation for google servers and even for our browser to render all that data at once now there is a, like a, so the part of your question was when is uh, what, when is the uh, when you decide to use the pagination right so again i would say like uh, it's it depends uh, the, the way i look at it, this problem is like what are my most uh, clients for example if i am developing a mobile app for ios i take the average screen size of uh, the mobile app and then make sure that these are number of the records i load it in one uh one go and then keep loading the rest hope that answer your question harish yeah 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 got it, got it. ashik has asked uh, do you know about trpc no ashik haven't heard about that trpc mm, no I'm, i'm not familiar with that okay uh any last questions from all of you watching us we'll just give one or two minutes for more questions or we are good to go load balancing any tips on load balancing um i think so obviously uh, load balancing creating your own load balancer server is uh, is an overkill for developers uh, the tips is use the amazon load balancer services uh and put your servers behind the amazon load balancer or if you have now even digital ocean if you know about the digital ocean they have these services uh the load balancing services uh to create the load balancer uh, to run a load balancer server uh, and then put uh, uh your other web services servers behind them aws load balancer versus api gateway that's an interesting one um so i don't um, i mean exactly uh, you can't compare both both of them exactly api gateway is more about like uh, to explore what are the apis available and load balancer is more about like if you have um for example um like a huge load and then using the various uh, like using the multiple servers uh, one of the use cases like even if you if you want to achieve a zero zero uh, minute downtime deployments you uh, you create multiple servers and then put them behind the load balancer and when you deploy 
you remove one server and then uh, add it back to the load balancer and then add the another server and then deploy on the uh, so the, the, that sequence will help you to keep your servers ser uh, service up and running all the time during in the deployment hamza has asked uh, authentication using jw is best or is there any other approach i think jwt is the best uh, other approach is you can also even create your own tokens uh, using the various uh, random uh, mechanism i have one question from youtube uh, joshua is asking while structuring your apis would mm -hmm. you use the same api for an application user which is like a front end mobile application mm -hmm. and a back office staff who's an admin for similar tasks, maybe handle it using a role parameter. How do you, how would you do it while structuring? Okay. Understood. So I think Joshua is trying, I think the question is more about like, if you're like, if, uh, some of the info, so let's say you have a client mobile application and then a back office admin application in the client application, obviously some of the information needs to be hidden in the back office. Some of needs to be. Uh, I think you have answered, Harish, that question. So you should use the right role-based access controls in your application. That is more about how you design your solution. And using those roles, if you uh, you pass, uh, if uh, if your server detects that okay, this uh, role, this user has a specific role, then based on that, they can decide like hide and show the information uh, in the response. Um, Ashik, you want to take Ashik's? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, tips for keeping the API safe. I think some of the tips, like I've mentioned, in rate limiting is a, is a one of the way to say, keep your API safe. Um, uh, use use the application web application firewalls. Uh, use uh, services from the Cloudflare to like uh, uh, stop the spams, bots. Um, uh, like uh, like uh, so these services will fight for you instead of you developing uh, writing the code for uh, fighting against the bots or the spam request these services will nullify the request before coming to the ser server and then obviously authentication is it good uh, ashik has asked is it good to storing customer data employee data admin data on the same db um now that's uh, that's a very broad question and uh, it's uh, see it's a uh, it depends so you know it depends how much normalize you want to do uh, in terms of like uh, data separation you know because the more normalization do the more it comes with the more support and you know more kiosk if you have a big huge teams to manage the multiple database servers then obviously go for it and there is a use case for it and for example the employee data if you have a customer data and employee data these both uh, does not need to be accessed at, at, the, at the same time um, also it also comes down to like how so the concept of the microservices right each microservice has their own uh, database their own servers and then their own um, authentication mechanism uh, they, they share the shared uh, they share the shared authentication mechanism so it's good if you can if your team can afford that type of structure because this come this brings a lot of support and you know uh, kiosk uh, kiosk in the team if you have a you big bigger team and because at the uh, at the end if you become an amazon type of services they have a huge data uh, huge data set uh, it's good to actually separate the information and then it also gives the team the sense of direction okay i am dedicated for let's say to take care of the customer data and i'm the other team is dedicated to take care of the employee employee data and their apis and the endpoints so I think it come it it depends on the use case uh, for simple applications uh, uh, for simple APIs. Uh, if you are building an app, simple mobile app, uh, I would suggest you start with the single database, keep the database in the in one place, keep your code in one place, and then go over from them. If you uh, if you hit 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 the ceiling that instead of like uh, adding the new feature into your application, you are spending more time on the support. Then start. 
thinking about uh, breaking down your replication into the multiple parts. Essential networking knowledge for advanced API building. Mm. Essential uh, networking knowledge for, I think, so, I mean, as a developer, if I look at uh, this problem, like what type of networking knowledge I have, have is, um, it really comes down to my role. So mostly like my role is involved in writing the APIs and the networking knowledge that I, I have uh, is uh, uh, like uh, identifying like what, what is the difference between HTTP methods? Um, how do you, what, what, is the, what are the headers? Uh, what is the body uh, of uh, your request and response? What else the networking uh, knowledge for advanced API building? Mm -hmm. can't, uh, can't think of anything apart from that at the moment. common best API response practice. Yeah, so one of them, I, as I shared in my uh, in the slide that Hetios, you should, your uh, response, if, if there's a pagination, your response should return like, the, instead of like returning uh, the metadata of uh, like how many total records left or what are the current records in the response, just return, instead of returning those numbers, I always try to return the full link for the pagination for the next and the previous page. That's all. That's a best practice, and it removed the guesswork from the front end uh, team. They just had to use those links as a pagination in their uh, in their code. Minaj, one last one last question that I want to ask before we wrap this up. Uh, apart from the context of building APIs for customers and um, my current job, right? It is also easier probably to learn building APIs using existing APIs that are out there probably yeah. starting with some simple apis and then hosting this application somewhere you hosted it on heroku heroku yeah. is now removing the free tier do yeah. you have any alternate uh places where we can put our apis to just test it out and play around with apis so uh i mean so if uh, i so if you look at like the services like heroku uh, uh aws has also similar services like where you don't need to have a lot of information about the infrastructure or deployment like beanstack uh, is their service uh, similar service like heroku but if you have a better like if you have a little bit knowledge of like how you can deploy your own application code digital ocean is one of the good i like re i really like the digital ocean services because they are simple is small any any side project that I work on or anything any new thing that we are we experiment at the work we always use the digital ocean uh, services because uh, Amazon have a very wide range of uh, information uh, services in their console uh, which like not which you don't need all the time and many of them actually not used most of the time uh, so digital ocean I would I suggest and they're Pricing is also reasonable. Thanks. Great. Uh, I think, okay, there's one more. When to use Lambda or EC2? When to use Lambda or EC2? Okay, so um, now, um, okay, so that's an interesting question. When to use Lambda? So, I mean, I can share like uh, in my, uh, one of the use case then where, where we use the Lambda and where we, like used uh, EC2. Like for example, most of our uh, most of our APIs are deployed on the EC2. Uh, but let's say I wanted to develop a utility uh, uh, using uh, uh, socket IO, which actually receive uh, a, a trigger from uh, trigger from customers and then just pass that information to another customer. For that, it was a really uh, easy to create a lambda function. Uh, using the Node.js uh, packet, and uh, that 
uh, that would actually take care of uh, so you i don't have to create a server in that case and just you create a lambda function for that yeah. awesome thank you manoj uh, any okay this is the last question we'll take uh, any free cloud services for testing any free aws is a free tier as long as you are i think uh, i think for one year they provide you these free tiers as long as you like go for the basic servers uh, they have uh, the free tiers and uh, heroku as I, i'm not sure uh, harish mentioned are they removing the free tier anytime soon yes I, okay november uh, okay uh, digital ocean uh, has uh, so they always market their servers start from five dollar month so it's very uh, reasonable price apart from that i don't i'm i'm not familiar with any other how to do live api updates uh, how to do live api updates for dashboards i i, I didn't get there how to do live api updates for dashboard for example let's say there is a graph so right. there is a like a real time dashboard right yeah so, yeah 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 so that's uh, i mean that's nothing to do exactly with the apis it's the way that how you implement your front end uh, you can actually uh, actually call the your apis using uh, using an interval on the front end side to get the latest data that's the one way the other way is um as i mentioned like you can use the technology such as the socket io uh, that uh, actually um like your server can send a uh, send a message to your client okay there's a new uh, new new information available like web sockets yeah exactly exactly the web sockets the server send an information there's a new information available now you should get a new information so then client aware about that and then client ask for the new information from the server yeah server circuits the web circuits are also a good way of uh, good way of actually building the real time dashboards i am not sure about that uh, ashik if how long will the web circuit last like is there a time that... i am not sure about that uh, ashik Augustin has asked, "Why is IBM Cloud infrastructure not being used like AWS?" Um, I think maybe they are hard to implement or not spent a lot of money on the marketing. <laughs> to be honest, I am not sure even there is a like what are the services in the IBM Cloud. Uh, like I am, I am aware there is a uh, Azure Cloud from the Microsoft. Um, um i'm aware there are some apis like uh, i've used like in the past um, in one of the hackathon they gave us these apis of nlp uh, getting the um, getting the sentiments of a text when you post the text to that api there were some apis from the ibm but uh, why is ibm cloud infrastructure not being used i think it's the same question like you could like some how well they have marketed their product how well priced they are how what like the bigger the adoption the easier the adoption the more people will start using and it is will spread i think again uh, also aws is one of the market leader uh, one of the very few when they started uh, providing the cloud services so Oh, Ashik, um, great. I mean, yeah, uh, it's it's pleasure talking uh, with you all, and it's pleasure answering all those questions. I love. I really enjoyed uh, the chat. I would suggest uh, send check out my GitHub as well, guys, and um, follow me there. Uh, I post my side experiments there, and uh, yeah, let's. We are we are in touch. I'm on the Slack channel as well on the Angel Hack. if you have any other question please feel free to ask there yeah that that brings me to my great segue of asking everybody to join angelax discord minaj please join uh, we can probably oh, okay. plan some discord yeah, yeah. Okay. we can do some discord uh, chat sessions in the future mm -hmm. uh, for our discord audience too but yes thank you so much for taking time out and coming today and doing this session uh, i think uh, just the volume of questions speaks how this went Thank you everybody mm -hmm. for asking questions.
minaj any uh, last words you want to share before no, this? thank you thank you everyone for listening and uh, yeah let's stay in touch on discord and enjoy building the apis take care bye awesome thank you so much everybody we'll see you uh, in september for now if you have any other sessions coming up we'll let you know do check our website join our discord all our updates are on these two channels always and of course uh, subscribe to our youtube if you are watching this on youtube we'll get back to you with the web3 session next month and uh, more interesting sessions coming up in different languages also so make sure you subscribe and uh, thank you once again minaj for doing this we'll schedule another one probably like a conversation on discord soon and sure. see you all next time okay take care thank bye you. everyone